week and watch for the authors in the near future on Book TV. Salon.com co-founder David Talbot is next on Book TV. His book, The Devil's Chessboard, focuses on the Dulles brothers, Alan Dulles, the longest-serving director of the CIA, and John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State under President Eisenhower. So, David, a couple of announcements to start off things, I think, did oh, you say? Well, or? No, not announcements, no? but I, uh, just a few uh, introductory remarks, maybe to set the stage for our conversation, Patrick. Uh, and uh, what, you want to introduce me first? <laughs> well, this is, uh, this is David Talbot, and I'm Patrick Marks. This is my little shop, the Green Arcade. You've probably been here before, or maybe not. And uh, thank you. We just celebrated seven years here. And David has been a, a part of it, actually. Uh, David was uh, born in uh, Los Angeles. And, uh, in a log cabin. <laughs> <laughs> and befitting, uh, befitting a legend, we don't know what year that was. <laughs> but, uh, and he, you know, his father was Lyle Talbot, Talbot who was an amazing heartthrob. And, he uh, and an actor. And, a, and uh, according to his sister Margaret, who wrote this book, uh -huh. The Entertainer. Uh, quite a guy, and it was quite a family. And his uh, brother Steve was also a really interesting guy. He was uh, uh, a fantastic documentarist, uh, video maker. Was very uh, well known for doing um, the Frontline series, and also to the baby boomers, he was known as Gilbert, Gilbert <laughs> on Leave It to Beaver. Yes, yes. We were so, a, sit a sitcom family. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, David was a journalist. He worked uh, during the heyday for Crawdaddy. Wow, that's, that's yeah. Deep I, I remember. <laughs> Who uh, remembers Crawdaddy here? The great rock and roll magazine, Rolling Stone. You yeah. probably know Rolling Stone, and uh, as the editor at Mother Jones, which is still going, doing really well. And interviewed David for the uh, this book, uh, The Devil's Chessboard, and I uh, was at the Examiner, and yeah. then he was one of the first people to sort of say, oh my God, the internet exists. Maybe we can do journalism on it. And he uh, started Salon.com, yes, which is still going and is still a vital organ. Can I use that word? <laughs> but uh, so his book, Season of the Witch, which you might know, if I can hold up the prop. And yay, there are several uh, major fans of this book, not only in San Francisco, but throughout the country. And uh, this book has recently been chosen as the one city, one book for the city of San Francisco uh, by the San Francisco Public Library. It's compulsory that you read it. <laughs> you must. It's it, the law. It's on, uh, the Muni bus tells you to read it. I mean, you know something's going on then. Uh, and then he also was the author of the best-selling book, uh, The Brothers. And The Brothers... Which I think is, uh, we can talk, you know, you'd let us know about this later, but the, it's the hidden history of the Kennedy years. So this idea of hidden history, I think, is sort of what we're kind of here tonight and what eventually led to the devil's chessboard, I would mm -hmm. say. Is that correct? Or? Yeah. I, uh, that's a safe statement. Now, he's also, one more thing, if I can go on to, with the introduction, is that uh, David is also, uh, amidst all these things he's been doing, he's also involved uh, in... Uh, in civic uh, matters recently with a group called Vision SF. And I don't know if you've heard of that, but if you haven't, you might look in, into it. And it has to do with, I don't know for lack of a better word, taking back our city. Yes. From the 1%. Yeah. As if that's not enough. <laughs> when do you have time to go to Zuni? <laughs> um, <laughs> I can always squeeze that in. He's also working now on, uh, or actually it's already going, and it's a, a new uh, series uh, called Hot Books. And the first book has come out, and it's called The Beast Inside. The Beast Side. I'm sorry, The Beast Side. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, the Beast Side. It's all that Dulles stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Living and Dying While Black in America. And this book is uh, just a, a fantastic book and a very important uh, commentary in our lives today here in this country, and there's a couple other books coming out soon. Is that true? Yeah, we can talk about that later. Okay. So without further ado, let's get to the Devil's Chessboard. Now, the, the uh, subtitle is Alan Dulles, the CIA and the Rise 
of America's secret government. So can you tell us how you got from the brothers to the devil's chessboard? Well, with your permission, uh, Patrick, I was just I'm going to start with a few remarks of my own, and then we get Please. into conversation mode. But I, I wanted to set the stage by uh, talking about uh, what I was trying to do with the book. Um, it's, it's basically a counter-narrative about power. You know, power tells its own story. Power is its best publicist. Power is its best spinner of the truth and of history. And uh, we've seen this again and again uh, throughout our lives, people my generation, and many of the people here. Uh, Saddam was behind 9-11. Saddam was producing weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the North Vietnamese fired on U.S. ships in the Gulf of Tonkin. Lee Harvey Oswald uh, single-handedly killed John F. Kennedy. No, Fidel Castro killed John F. Kennedy. These are the stories that power has told about our, itself throughout my lifetime. They, essentially, these are the real conspiracy theories. And they're told by power with the complicity of the American media, the corporate media. And these are the stories that have had, unfortunately, some tragic consequences as well, as we all know, from the examples that I just cited. So it's the job of people like me, uh, historians, uh, alternative historians, journalists, to present the truth, <laughs> basically, to cut through this myth-making, uh, this uh, spinning of history, uh, of reality, and, uh, you know, it's, it's no easy task because there's Hollywood, there's uh, the corporate media, there's Fox News. Uh, and again and again, day after day, 24-7, they're telling us their reality. And as Steve Wright Mills, the great sociologist who wrote The Power Elite back during the Cold War in the 1950s and was one of the first to really analyze the phenomenon of the Dulles brothers and that power circle, as he famously said about these men, such men as these, because they were 99% men in those days and probably 96% today, such men as these are crackpot realists. In the name of re realism or reality, they've created a paranoid reality, reality all of their own. And we're forced to live within that paranoid reality. Mm -hmm. It's the communists out to kill us. It's, uh, you know, uh, people living in a cave somewhere in Afghanistan. There's always a bogeyman. There's always someone that we have to fear. And as a result of that, they've created a lucrative racket. And that's what it is. That's, that's what happened during the Cold War. That's what's happening during the War on Terror. So it's the job of people like myself. It's the job of, of you all, of an engaged citizenry, to see through that mythology to do the work, to do the research, to know what's really happening in our country and make the right decisions. By the end of reading my book, and I hope you read the book, um, I hope you believe, as I do, that the name Dulles should go down in infamy in American history. Just like the name Kissinger, the name Cheney, the name Rumsfeld, these are names that should be stripped off uh, the, uh, every building, every airport, Dulles Airport, and replaced with the names of true American heroes like Martin Luther King and others. And so tonight, I want to announce a campaign to do exactly that, to take the name Dulles, it was named after John Foster Dulles, who has his own criminal background, uh, the brother of Alan Dulles, who was Secretary of State under Eisenhower, take that name off the name of our nation's capital, the airport, where so many people, thousands of people each day, come from around the world. It's the gateway to our country. And it's a name that should instead, as I say, go down in infamy and be replaced by a name that stands for peace and world harmony. So with that, well, <laughs> opening statement, let's have a talk. Well, one of the things, you know, I've, I've is this my water, by yes, the way? Yes, it is. Okay. One of the things I'm wondering about is the process of, of doing that, of doing the research of what... In doing this book, where did you go and what did you do and, and how much were you aware of initially? I've read the book, so if you haven't, you'll be, you might think you know a lot of, of these stories about uh, the CIA unsettling governments of assassination, of extraordinary rendition, 
But how did you, where did you go? Did you travel around? Did you meet people <laughs> who talked? Did you go well, to archives? I know Karen Croft, one of your, your partners, uh, did a lot of work. And you were in Italy. Yeah. Yeah, we did a lot of work. Karen Croft, who is my colleague and collaborator, is here tonight. I couldn't have done the book without her. Uh, and w since the book really begins uh, with the Nazi period, with Alan Dulles going to Switzerland during World War II as a member, uh, as a leading uh, you know, agent of the OSS, which was our spy agency during World War II, of course we're dealing with you know, history that is quite old at this point in terms of trying to find living uh, voices who can tell, tell you about that history. And of course we follow sort of the Dulles arc through World War II and into the Cold War and then through the Kennedy period. And it really is an epic narrative about, as I said earlier, the struggle which we've been living through all our lives between the forces of secrecy, of permanent war, and the forces of democracy. And uh, it's really a battle for the, the soul of our nation. Uh, so, yeah, many of the people, of course, from that era, including Alan Dulles himself, of course, is long dead, but their children, in many cases, are still alive. We interviewed Alan Dulles' daughter, Joan. Uh, we interviewed uh, some key people who are still living from that period. And, of course, we uh, used documents, the documents that we could use. Now, that's a whole other game, of course, the government plays. Uh, as Orwell told us in 1984, uh, those who would control the future control the past. And so it's a struggle for every researcher, for every historian, for every journalist who's trying to dig up the history that belongs to the American people to get at those documents. And of course the government often still withholds these documents. Uh, we'll well, you, get, also docu you also yeah. talk about how they constantly were destroying documents. Well, they destroy documents, they hide them, they, they refuse, they, you know, in violation often of federal law to release them. Uh, because of political pressure, there was a bill passed in 1998 under Clinton, uh, the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act. And I did use uh, many, many documents f uh, that were released as part of that treasure trove. But that was only came about because of uh, stiff political pressure from Elizabeth Holtzman, who was a congresswoman at the time, uh, and others in Congress. Uh, to get the CIA to release these documents that uh, with, because they were often embarrassing to our intelligence agencies because what many of these documents showed and what my book uh, goes into in, in depth is the extent to which U.S. security agencies were actually collaborating uh, with Nazi forces even during the war in the case of Alan Dulles in Switzerland and certainly after the war when we wanted to repurpose many of these uh, Nazi officials for the war against the Soviet Union, the Cold War. So yeah, it's always a battle. Sometimes you have to file Freedom of Information Act lawsuits. Even that doesn't work often. They stonewall you. Uh, we can talk about the Kennedy era. That's a whole other story where they, uh, again, in violation of federal law, the JFK Records Act that was passed in the early 1990s, still refused to release key documents related to the Kennedy presidency and his assassination. So it really is up to the American people to decide whether we want our own history. It belongs to us. Are we going to demand it or not? I mean, that's what it comes down to. But don't you think at the same time there's this idea of, uh, what well, you're saying, there's, there's this constant breaking of the law. And, and they get away with it. And Dulles got away with it constantly. And he made sure he got away with it. And then also, because of the complicity you know, between lawmaking, that type of gov that other government, and let's say the private sector, because they all came from Wall Street. So we've sort of seen this kind of complicity. Of what, and then eventually you end up with what you, uh, you call the deep state, or maybe that's Peter Dale Scott's mm -hmm. the deep state. Or, mm -hmm. But this concept of another uh, another operating. Now this obviously uh, didn't die with Alan Dulles, do you think? No, I mean... Uh, I'm just leading you on on that question. Yeah, I mean, again, the, uh, these forces, and I, what, what, it's what C. Wright Mills in the 1950s called the power elite. The, it's a permanent government, essentially, uh, that operates no matter who is, happens to be elected or in the White House. Uh, men like Alan Dulles thought that democracy was too important to be left in the hands of mere people like you and me or our elected representatives. So they kept power as tightly as they could within their circle. Uh, these were Wall Street, right, bankers. Uh, the Dulles brothers ran the most powerful law firm on Wall Street, Sullivan and Cromwell. Uh, 
they uh, you know, often you know shuttle back and forth between Washington and and Wall Street uh, in national security positions and so on. Uh, high level corporate officials, military and intelligence officials, they belong to the same clubs. Uh, they their children go to the same schools. They intermarry. It's a very cohesive power circle. Particularly so, I think in those days. Maybe it's a little more diverse, a little more complex today than when C. Wright Mills was running the power elite in the late 1950s during the Dulles era. But uh, there's a lot of cohesion, and they work within organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations uh, in New York, which the Dulles brothers dominated for many years. And this is where they work out their ideas and their policies, whether it's to overthrow the democratically elected government in Guatemala because it's threatening uh, U.S. corporate interests, or whether it's to drop the bombs, uh, nuclear bombs, atomic bombs on Japan, uh, or whether it's to kill a president. Uh, I think they work these ideas out among themselves. I'm not suggesting that Alan Dulles is some Superman who uh, went about, you know, doing all this mischief around the world and at home all by himself. Uh, he was very much a corporate lawyer in that respect. He would only act, I think, when he felt that there was a consensus within that group. And so they did have the mechanisms, like the Council on Foreign Relations and others, and they still do, to work out this policy. Um, and, of course, most of this, if not all of it, uh, in many cases, is kept secret from the American people. So, you know, and that leads us to the, the idea of the fifth estate. Now, let's say that, uh, like, we're always talking about now how the, um, the journalism has, it's more difficult. Uh, but, you know, in reading your book, it seems that the New York Times was in their pocket, and there was very little, dis it, it seems that dissent was not, didn't really come from not the know, media. It, yeah, it, the media was the, not the watchdogs. The they, media sh they should be, and there really wasn't a watchdog. And, and it, even though you know, you do point out that even in the highest circle as a power, like within the White House, w these guys were doing their own thing, and they were beyond the law. Well the, well, the media was actually part of this power circle. So I should say that, you know, among the other members of the Council on Foreign Relations are often the top executives of the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, CBS, and so on. And they're all on a first a name uh, basis, a very chummy ba basis with Alan Dulles. In fact, he would hold these annual kind of uh, drink fests uh, around New Year's each uh, year where he would invite the top people, the top uh, reporters and editors and executives from these uh, leading media organizations at, at his club. His club was called the Alibi Club, which was appropriate. Uh, and so the, it, it was very cozy, a very cozy relationship. And so when people said, well, certainly these things would have been exposed by the American media. <laughs> I mean, we have this va vast, you know, uh, kind of media apparatus and you know I always laugh about that as someone who spent my whole life in the media and knowing you know how compromised actually most uh, people uh, in the, these media organizations are compromised by power and uh, you know even today you know the New York Times was very complicit of course in the WMD lies uh, uh, that led uh, tragically to the war in Iraq and to the ongoing uh, disaster uh, of the, that's going on in the Middle East today. But certainly back in Alan Dulles' time, I mean, you can go into his files, as I did, and Karen and I, in Princeton, uh, and, you know, the files are largely purged, of course, of, you know, the most uh, probably revealing stuff by the CIA. But uh, there still is a lot in there that's very interesting. And among other things are his very chummy letters back and forth with these media figures at the New York Times and Newsweek and so on. He's alley to them. I mean, you know, he has nicknames for them. Uh, one letter after uh, the Warren Report came out, and he was, of course, a very important figure on the Warren Report. Some people thought he dominated it to the extent that it should have been called the Dulles Commission, not the Warren Commission. Mm -hmm. And after, uh, this is a, a letter from the Washington Bureau Chief, I believe, of Newsweek to Alan Dulles uh, after the Warren Report came out saying, Dear Mr. Dulles, thank you so much for directing our coverage, basically, of the Warren Commission, of the Warren Report. We couldn't have done it under such a tight deadline without your guiding hand, you know. <laughs> so um, it's right there to be read in these files. So uh, in, just to bring it up to the present, so how... How has this book been, how do you feel your book has been posited or been received and could you talk a little bit about that even in your hometown? They're gobsmacked, the media. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Because um, it's been interesting. I, yeah. Again, I've read some of them, so I was wondering how you feel about that. Because some of them have been really rather strange, I think. Well, if I hadn't shocked the media, I don't think I would have done my job. I mean, you know, they are the gatekeepers. They, uh, as I s start off with my introductory remarks by saying, they have an interest in telling a certain version about America. And so this is a counter story, uh, a counter narrative. And uh, so, the, yeah, there's been great resistance to the book from the media gatekeepers. Uh, I've been told that uh, the Washington Post is not going to review it. But I slipped one by them there, and I actually wrote an op-ed piece that it did appear in, in the Washington Post. <laughs> so you do what you can do. It's guerrilla warfare. Um, I was on my way to Al Jazeera America in a car in Manhattan uh, a week or so ago on my book tour. Uh, I was lined up to, by, you know, to do an interview um, in New York for Al Jazeera America, and suddenly my publicist got an uh, email saying it's been canceled. And when he asked why, he was surprised, of course. Uh, he got a one-word reply in, through the email, politics. So they were pretty upfront about it. Uh, Politico, the um, yeah, online publication uh, started by former Washington Post people and has become sort of the voice online for mainstream political coverage. They had me lined up to do something. One of the key people there uh, who uh, actually is a very good reporter, called my book a masterpiece and said that he wanted me very badly to write something based on the book for Politico, but someone above him spiked it at the last moment and instead ran a piece by a guy named Phil Shannon, who is a former New York Times reporter, who has been peddling a CIA disinformation line for some time now, mainly that Fidel Castro was behind uh, the murder of President Kennedy which is literally the oldest conspiracy theory there is about JFK's assassination and complete BS. So, uh, you know, that's what happens. It's a war. Writing is fighting. I didn't, ex I didn't expect anything different from this book. But the fact is that it's not a media monolith. We, people like us, have ways to get uh, messages out. There's alternative media. There's Democracy Now!, there's Pacifica Radio, there's Mother Jones, there's Salon, which was why I started Salon, to have an alternative voice like that. And because of that, the book has now become a bestseller, which I'm very proud of, despite this pushback. Great. Yeah. That's what I wanted to hear you say. Right on. And it's uh, doing, I think it did, started taking off really in California for some reason. Is that correct? Uh, California led the way, yeah. It became yay. a bestseller here first. And Northern California first. So this, is, I don't know if this is a silly question or not, but uh, can I ask a possible silly question? Of course. So it has to do with extraordinary rendition. So do you, in reading this book, I, these people, the, and, the, and the effect still of, I can see why you called it the devil's chessboard, because they really were playing with nations, with people, and the effects, so many of them, were deaths, suicide, nations in, you know, crumbled, you know, a legacy of ashes, as, uh, you know, as the term goes. So, were you, too, uh, do you guys ever fear for your own lives? <laughs> you, you mean you think I'll end up at Guantanamo? Well, I... I uh, Probably not as a public figure. It's <laughs> more difficult these days. I don't know. I'm just curious, you know, does that thought, like even reading it sometimes you think, oh, God, it's creepy. Well, again, my, my, the point is to have an impact uh, to shift uh, the public's understanding of what's happening in our country. Uh, this is not just ancient history. This is history that's still very relevant today. Extraordinary rendition, torture, uh, extra-legal assassinations, mass surveillance of private citizens. All of these began not after 9-11, but under the reign of Alan Dulles back in the Cold War. So for us to understand that Cold War history is essential for us to confront what's going on in our country today. So do I worry about my own self? No. I worry about what's still happening to people in Pakistan, people in Afghanistan, to our own soldiers who are asked to fight these endless wars uh, under impossible circumstances. Uh, so that's what drives me. It, it's, it, it's that this is on my conscience, this is on my soul as an American, as, an, as a journalist and historian, like I know it's on all of our uh, consciences here tonight. And we have to say finally enough. 
And it's my job to give us the information, and, and there's other wonderful people out there doing the same. People I worked with at Salon, like Glenn Greenwald, who's an American mm -hmm. hero, Jeremy Scahill, many others doing the same. And that's why I started this new book imprint, Hot Books, to be able to publish more books like this that shed light on what's happening to our country today. But at some point, we do have to say enough. You know, the presidential campaign is underway right now, and there's no focus at all on these issues that Ed Snowden tried to bring forth, uh, you know, about the, the growth of this big brother state that has intruded into every aspect of our lives. Well, this, uh, you know, the hearing with Hillary Clinton, with uh, Benghazi, there was no mention of what the actual thing was. Right. There was no talk about why are we there, what, what, why, why, why... Why do they hate us? <laughs> that is a good question. Well, exactly. I mean, we're shocked that people, uh, when we start to have uh, heavy boots in all these countries and interfere in all these other countries, we're shocked that actually people fire guns at us and our emissaries and, and try to kill us. I mean, this should not be shocking the American people. Or that there's atrocities like the hospital in Afghanistan that was run by doctors without borders that uh, children and nurses and, and doctors are blown up uh, in these attacks that are supposedly collateral damage. Well, collateral damage is an essential part of an imperial uh, situation, an imperial war that we are constantly fighting. That's what happens in these situations. We, are, our representatives, our soldiers are killed, and to a much greater extent, the civilians in these poor, uh, benighted countries where we've intruded, where we've invaded, uh, die by the thousands. And so, again, uh, this is a legacy of the Alan Dulles imperial arrogance of this country that we have a right to the world. That's what they felt like coming out of World War II. They had a right to the world. We have a right to the world's markets. We have a right to the world's resources. We have a right to do whatever we want to people around the world who are less powerful than we are. And at some point, we, you know, you have to understand there's going to be blowback, there's going to be consequences, and, uh, you know, the American people need to wake up to this, and uh, I hope my book is at least a small part of that awakening. So the, uh, let me ask you then about uh, one of the hot books, I think the topic is about war criminals. <laughs> yeah. But doesn't this kind of fit right in? Well, right. Uh, so Hot Books is this new imprint I've started with Skyhorse Publishing, which is a very brave and independent uh, publisher in New York, run by a publisher named Tony Lyons. And one of our first books, after The Beast Side, which we talked about earlier, is a book called American Nuremberg. And it's been written by a philosophy professor at USF, University of San Francisco, right here, Rebecca Gordon. Uh, and she wrote a book earlier for Oxford University Press called Mainstreaming Torture that looked at how we've become culturally, uh, you know, uh, accustomed now to accepting torture in our name as, a, as part of U.S. policy. And this book, she looks at the top U.S. officials in both the Bush and Obama administrations from those presidents on down, from President Bush and President Obama themselves, who should, by the principles and standards that were set at Nuremberg after World War II, be tried for war crimes. Um, and it's a very restrained, very, uh, I think, uh, uh, provocative uh, argument for why we should hold at least a citizen's tribunal. Because politically, of course, we know it's impossible to create something official like Nuremberg. It, there's just not enough uh, political opportunity for obvious reasons to do that in this country. But there are precedents like the Russell Tribunal that Bertrand Russell, British philosopher, mm -hmm. established during uh, the 1960s with Jean-Paul Sartre uh, to examine war crimes in Vietnam. This was a very distinguished commission uh, back in 1967. And I think, again, for the soul of our country, for our own conscience, we have to take steps as uh, as an engaged citizenry to do something like this, to examine what's been done in the last 15 years under the so-called war on terror in our names. I agree. So uh, you, you tell the story about Jesus de Galindez. 
Jesus de Galendas, yes. And I was wondering if you could just tell a story, because I, I, I wanted to read a quote that happened after that, if you just... Well, so you bring up Extraordinary Rendition. Again, nothing new here. Uh, this was not an invention of Dick Cheney and, and Don Rumsfeld. Uh, it was actually a creation of the CIA during uh, the Cold War. So in one of the first cases of Extraordinary Rendition that I'm aware of, it's a remarkable story. There was a young, uh, brilliant scholar um, named Jesus de Galindas, who was a, a refugee from Basque, Spain. He fled uh, Franco's fascist government after the war. Ended up, unfortunately, uh, jumping out of the frying pan into the fire because he ended up in the Dominican Pr Republic, which was then under the brutal rule of Rafael Trujillo. Uh, when he fell afoul of the Trujillo dictatorship, he fled there and ended up in New York City where he was studying for his PhD in Columbia and working as a lecturer at Columbia. Well, he, his PhD thesis was about, actually, an inside look, because he'd had some inside information about the brutality of the Trujillo dictatorship. And Trujillo's agents were everywhere. He was a very uh, powerful guy, uh, backed strongly by the Eisenhower government, by the CIA, because he was a supposedly anti-communist. That's all you had to be in those days to get U.S. backing. Mm -hmm. And uh, his agents stalked uh, Galindas in New York City. They showed up in his classrooms and tried to intimidate him. They tried to threaten him into uh, stopping, uh, you know, seizing work on his, his thesis. But he uh, refused. And so one day he was uh, headed home uh, downtown uh, from Columbia and he was grabbed by agents who actually went under the employ of the CIA these were CIA contractors. He was hustled to an uh, airport in, on Long Island and flown back to the Dominican Republic where he was horribly tortured and, and murdered by Trujillo. So this is what extraordinary rendition is. And this happened uh, in the 1950s, not you know, after the 9-11. And then I guess uh, this is from your book. One of, your, one of the students from Columbia, who I think his name was Joy. What was her name, Maria Joy? One of his students, yeah. Yeah, and she wrote, if this can happen here, what is left? Everybody who has some sense of responsibility and a feeling for democracy and freedom should be concerned. And I just thought that is what your book is all about. Yeah, that was absolutely, that, I thought that was a very moving letter that she wrote, I think, to the New Republic, was it? It was the New Republic. Yeah. yeah, in trying to get people to be concerned about this case, because at that point they didn't know where Galindus had gone, he'd been disappeared. Uh, but, of course, they had you know, suspicions about what had happened to him. And the Eisenhower, actually even President Eisenhower is asked about his disappearance during a press conference, and he kind of avoided answering. Um, Columbia University was kind of complicit in a way because the president, Grayson Kirk at the time, was uh, sat on commissions and, and foundations that were supported by the CIA. Uh, the Columbia administration did nothing to look into the Galindas case. So, it, you know, it's again one of these dark uh, episodes from the CIA history uh, that we write about in, in The Devil's Chessboard. But again, I just think that this concern is why we're all here and why you do what you do. And I also wanted to say, you know, ask you um, what, what is new that you really, what's the newest thing that you found out in doing this that you found most relevatory? Well, I think the, the key sort of uh, headlines from my book began with the Nazi period, began with the extent to which Alan Dulles and his circle, his intelligence circle, collaborated with the Nazis before, in the case of Sullivan and Cromwell, the Wall Street law firm, because they represented Nazi business interests, including IG Farben, the notorious chemical company that produced Zyklon B, the pesticide that was used to exterminate Jews. And, you know, they're exchanging Christmas cards, the F Dulles brothers, with the heads of uh, I.G. Farben up into, actually into the early war period. Uh, Dulles, from his perch in Switzerland during the war, continued to represent Nazi interests. He was trying to cut deals, uh, side deals, in defiance of uh, Roosevelt's policy of unconditional surrender with Nazi emissaries, uh, separate peace deals. After the war, he helps establish the so-called rat lines that were escape routes for Nazi war criminals that were set up uh, so they could flee from Germany over the Alps down through Italy and overseas to safety. He even helped 
uh, rehabilitate some of the more notorious Nazi war criminals, allowing them to go back into daily life, even official life in West Germany, post-war Germany. The top spy master in West Germany, I tell the story, is Reinhard Galen, who was Hitler's top spy master on the bloody Eastern Front. And uh, Alan Dulles helped install him as the top intelligence official in uh, West German government. He would played a very important role in the Cold War for many years. So that's number one, the collaboration with the Nazis. I argue in some ways that we didn't crush the Third Reich so much as repurpose it for the Cold War. Uh, secondly, there's a lot of things in the Cold War period that I go into that haven't come out before, uh, including the fact that we targeted not only uh, governments in Guatemala, which we know about, Iran, which was with great disastrous results that we're still dealing with today, but even the, the government of an ally, President Charles de Gaulle in France, uh, antagonized uh, national security interests uh, in this country, in Dallas in particular, by trying to settle the war in Algeria, the colonial war. Um, U.S. national security interests were concerned. They thought that Algeria and North Africa, with its oil, might fall into Soviet hands as a result. They thought uh, de Gaulle was too stubborn a nationalist. He was flirting with the idea of breaking away from NATO and so on. And so in 1961, on the heels of the uh, one other CIA crisis, the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba, mm. young President Kennedy, who's just been inaugurated a couple months before, is now faced with another crisis related to the CIA. Charles de Gaulle and his government are f furious, are screaming that the CIA is backing a right-wing French military coup against him. And uh, President Kennedy is put in an extremely awkward position <clears throat> of telling the de Gaulle government, well, I'm not in control of the CIA. I can't speak for them. I'm not supporting this coup, but I'm not in, I can't speak for the CIA. Uh, and then finally, I think the, the big headline, of course, in my book that's getting a lot of pushback from the uh, media gatekeepers looks at Alan Dulles' involvement in the Kennedy assassination itself. De Gaulle, by the way, felt that uh, these Dulles forces were behind the assassination of President Kennedy. He told his uh, information minister when he came back from the funeral of John Kennedy that the same national security forces in the U.S. that targeted me killed President Kennedy. That has never been really reported in this country. Um, that book has never even been translated. It was a memoir by de Gaulle's information minister that he wrote that was published in France, never translated in the U.S. So that's uh, very important. I present, I think, very compelling new evidence that ties Dulles to the assassination and, of course, to the cover-up because he played such a critical role on the Warren Commission. I mean, how convenient. This guy who had been fired by President Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs, a bitter enemy of the president, ends up being the top investigator into his, crime, into his murder. I mean, this is the way that this power group worked with, again, the complicity or laziness of the American media. Absolutely. Maybe we sh you want to turn it over to well, the I crowd? was going to say, you know, so let's have a big hand for David. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we'd like to know if you want to do a little Q&A here. If you do, if you could come up and talk into the microphone, that would be great. And we also would like to uh, make sure it's a question and uh, not a statement, if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I know people sort of save a statement at the end, huh? But, uh, <laughs> so, would anybody like to come up? Right. Mm -hmm. You need to come up and talk if you want, if you want to ask. Here. This, one here. this one I just noticed what came out what was, along with your book was a bun another rerun of uh, Gary Webb, and I was wondering if you'd like to talk about connections across those two. The journalist Gary Webb. Yeah. Journalist, yeah. Uh, so the question was about the journalist Gary Webb, who uh, wrote uh, The Dark Alliance, was that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, as a reporter for the San Jose Mercury, he investigated um, the uh, connection between uh, CIA and the Contras uh, in Central America and how they allowed the Contras to run drugs into this country to help finance their activities there. Uh, and it was a, uh, a bombshell when that story broke. Uh, 
he came under heavy fire from the CIA uh, as a result of it and heavy pressure ultimately from his own newspaper and from the American media that kind of went after him instead of pursuing the story itself. And he ended up being, you know, uh, his career ended up being ruined. And, and it was, uh, I think, one of the great tragedies of American journalism that here's, you know, one of the great truth tellers, one of the brave uh, investigative journalists. And, uh, you know, instead of winning the awards that he should have won, his career was ruined and he ended up actually uh, committing suicide. So the, uh, the there, you know, I, I was at Salon at the time. I think one of the great regrets I have actually is not being tuned in enough to that story as it was happening to hire Gary Webb and, and put him to work because those kind of uh, talented and intrepid journalists are far too f few. Uh, and I would have loved to have given him another safety raft. Um, and when I saw read about read about his story by because uh, it was written by by Nicholas Scow, who was actually a very good reporter, Kill the Messenger. It later became a great movie with Jeremy Renner, uh, starring as Gary Webb. You should all see the movie and read the book. And in fact, uh, because of Karen Croft, I signed up Nicholas Scow to write a book for me for the Hot Book series. Oh, great! What's that? Um, well. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're on a need to know basis, Patrick. Right. Yeah, it's still it's still in, in, <laughs> in a kind of a hush hush mode. Oh, sh <laughs> cut that out. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so Gary Webb uh, is a hero, uh, and uh, you know, unfortunately, he's not with us any longer. And I'm inspired by what he did, uh, in part by what I've done with the Devil's Chessboard. That's great. I, I'm, I'm glad if the people are making that connection. Anybody else like to come up and ask a question? You could come up and ask a question. I think I'd use them. I can talk loud. That's are not you gonna, sure Gary we're, Webb? We're going through. If you could come up and if you want to. So you're asking if Gary Webb did indeed commit suicide? Yeah, there, there's definitely some, uh, some, you know, ways about the way he supposedly committed suicide that have raised questions. I, I'm sorry, sir. I just don't know enough about the details to go into it. Um, so let's, uh, let's, we'll leave it there. Other questions here? Yeah, if you would. If uh, presidents don't have the power, the power somewhere else, then how could we as citizens have a criminal who would we ta take against this criminal court? You know, how, how do we get to the power? Not Bush or Obama, but the yeah. real power. Well, that, that's a very, <laughs> you've put your finger on the key question. Uh, how do we go about holding these people accountable? Uh, we are in a de democracy, nominally. Um, and how do we go about uh, acting as if uh, the the popular will, the public will matters. So as I said um, earlier, you know, obviously we don't control Congress. Every wing of the government is in support of the war on terror. Every wing of government is in support of suppressing our own history, of not releasing documents that the American people have a right to. Uh, we probably are in a worse situation right now than we were even in some ways during the Cold War. Uh, because of the sort of uh, you know reign of terror uh, and repression that 9/11 unleashed, so what we can do is unfortunately I think we have to do outside of the mainstream political arena. We have to I think be inspired as I said earlier by things like the Bertrand Russell Commission during the Vietnam War. I think that would be an amazing uh, uh, you know step forward if we could bring together legal scholars, some people from the political system, investigative journalists, uh, experts in constitutional law and so on, uh, and bring them together for, an, for this uh, public inquiry into uh, you know, the war on terror and the crimes that have been committed in our name and, 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 and you know, organize this in such a way that it got maximum media exposure and, you know, various public organizations, uh, hopefully human rights groups, uh, participate in this. I think that would at least begin the national dialogue that we're missing in the presidential campaign. 
I mean, these issues aren't being discussed at all, even by Bernie Sanders, as far as I uh, know. Bernie has done a wonderful job of focusing on the wealth gap, which is another, you know, um, enormous crisis for the country. And, and I, I, you know, obviously we, you know, we have to commend him for doing that. That was desperately needed also, that national discussion. But the national discussion about the permanent war that we're in, and whenever you're in a permanent war situation, it's, gonna, it's going to erode democracy at home. You can't have those two things existing at the same time. Because a national security state is anathema to a democracy, to a healthy democracy. So there's no way that Congress is going to do this on its own. We have to act as a... We created this public commission, a public inquiry, in Washington, D.C. to shame Congress and to get as much media exposure as we could, it would at least initiate this national discussion that we sorely need at this point. Yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, with regard to uh, a national security state being inconsistent with the democracy, uh, last night on Charlie Rose, Ted Koppel uh, appeared talking about uh, the possibility of uh, internet sabotage and this kind of thing. Do you have any comments to make about that? I think that's the beginning. He seems to be launching a campaign to raise consciousness about this this uh, problem. And I, I personally don't think the national security state is going to go away anytime soon. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on Koppel's campaign. Well, I'm not clear about what he's doing. Is he trying to suggest that the Internet is a, a terrorist tool and that we have to crack down on it somehow? We're very vulnerable to uh, mass blackouts, you know. Through. Right. That, so they always have some new scare for us, you know, some new thing that we have to hide under the beds and worry about our beds. So, you know, Ted Koppel, I think, is part of that corporate media, that national security media. He has been his whole career. What's shocking is when some of these guys actually start to break away from that consensus. You know, Dan Rather gave me a shout out. Dan Rather was part of that, you know, sort of corporate mainstream world for many years and then of course had his own kind of uh, traumatic break with it uh, following the story he did on Bush and the National uh, Guard. Uh, and as a result, he was fired by CBS. And so now he's been in the wilderness for some time, and uh, he, gave, he was good enough to give me a shout-out for the devil's chessboard and said, you know, you've been telling the truth for a long time now, and so uh, that was great to hear from him. Unfortunately, it, ha it happens for some of these people after they're sort of like, you know, thrown overboard. Um, I wish it happened while they were actually in positions of power and we could, they could do more, uh, you know, to uh, enlighten the American people. But yeah, I don't believe what Ted Koppel says. I don't believe what Charlie Russell, uh, Charlie Rose, rather, uh, you know, his point of view either. These are very mainstream people. They're not about shaking up, uh, you know, the national conversation. They're about putting America to sleep, which he often does for me. Hi, Mr. Albert. I finished a book this summer uh, by L. Fletcher Prouty, The Secret mm -hmm. Team. And I was curious, he seems to suggest that the... Uh, the Fletcher Prouty, you said. Prouty, yes, mm -hmm. uh, the secret team. He seems to suggest that the 1947 National Security Act seems to have given the CIA their, their power or whatever. And uh, how do you feel about uh, maybe changing that? I know changing the names on airports and everything would be good, but maybe something that really... Mm -hmm. took something away from them, such as that. Yeah, power. so uh, L. Fletcher Prouty was an Air Force officer and an American hero. You know, the American military uh, has a number of these people throughout our history, uh, thankfully. Uh, Smedley Darling but uh, Butler. Uh, uh, how many people know Smedley Bar Darlington Butler's name? <laughs> the, the famous Marine hero who actually uh, became a great champion of peace and democracy. Uh, and Fletcher Prouty is another military hero, and people should uh, read uh, his books. He's not with us any longer, but he, he wrote uh, extensively about how the national security state was eroding democracy. And in fact, was in a great position to see this happen because he was the liaison at one point between the Air Force and Alan Dulles' CIA, so he knew Alan Dulles quite well. 1947 is the year that uh, the CIA is created, the National Security uh, you know, Charter is passed, 
Uh, Harry Truman is president. Uh, he later felt, came to feel, that he created a Frankenstein. And I think Prouty probably believed the same. Uh, but this was the president himself who was saying this. Uh, he al always intended, he said, Truman, for the CIA to be nothing more than an intelligence gathering organization that would then uh, collate the best information and pass it on to the president in the White House. But instead it became this, um, this action uh, arm that went around the world uh, overthrowing governments and assassinating people and so on. And Harry Truman wrote a remarkable op-ed piece about this in the Washington Post shortly after President Kennedy was killed. And it really was a bombshell at the time, given the kind of traumatized state of the nation then, just weeks after Dallas. And what he wrote in the Washington Post was that, yes, that the CIA was, had become this kind of rogue agency, and that was not only endangering democracies overseas, but at home. So Alan Dulles was stunned by this, uh, and he knew he couldn't let it stand. So he immediately goes into action. He tries to strong arm Harry Truman, who's now around 80 years old, retired in Independence, Missouri. He tries to pressure Truman into withdrawing, retracting his own article. Uh, you know, but Truman's a stubborn guy, famously, and, and refuses. So Dulles flies down to Missouri and personally, again, puts the pressure on him and says, oh, Mr. President, you certainly remember that when you created the CIA, you wanted it to be this activist agency and so on. Truman won't hear anything uh, of that and, and stands by his article. So Dulles does the next best thing. He can't change reality. So what does he do? And this is how, of course, intelligence agencies operate all the time. They change the record. So he writes a letter for the record, Dulles, to the general counsel of the CIA and says, oh, I just came back from visiting Harry Truman. You know, he was very uh, upset to hear uh, that his article had been read that way. He didn't mean to say that. He was confused about how it actually had, had come through that way. He made him out to be, in other words, this senile guy who didn't know what he was doing. Maybe some deputy had put him up to it and so on. So that became the CIA's official story. It got picked up in various histories and various essays written by CIA-friendly historians and so on. So Alan Dulles was a master at that, at manipulating the truth when the truth didn't satisfy his needs. Um, you obviously uh, uh, command a huge amount of information related to the Dulles era and especially the Kennedy assassination and all of the enormous literature that's come out of it. And the credibility of that material um, is uh, spotty, shall we say. And I'm just curious, there's um, the, the story that's always sort of alleged about the plot to sort of involve uh, Cuba more deeply in the assassination of John Kennedy, but yet uh, very few um, uh, bits of, of information have ever surfaced uh, trying to make that connection uh, more tangible. So you uh, mean the allegation that Fidel Castro is behind the assassination? Or, or that, uh, that there was some complicity there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I came across a book uh, a few years ago that was the, is the only source that I know that really uh, talks about this called JFK The Second Plot. Uh, by a guy named Matthew Smith, published in the England. Um, and I'm just curious to know, are you familiar with it? I'm not, no. Um, What's he say? It basically, that the sheriff of the adjoining county to Dallas um, actually has uh, the wing numbers of the airplane that was sitting idling on the runway at the time of the assassination with a flight plan to Cuba. And the allegation was that Oswald or someone was, was supposed that, to fly there. Yes, and there's there's a whole series of connections about how the he was supposed to be transported, you know, to the airport that the the sheriff uh, seems to corroborate. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting tidbit that I kept looking for in your book. I uh, just finished it right. a few days ago. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I can't comment uh, specifically on the book, unfortunately, because I haven't read it. But I will comment, and I think it's very important, on this long, uh, you know, uh, complicated, you know, allegation that Fidel Castro in Cuba was somehow involved in the assassination of President Kennedy. I think it's, you know, 
to be blunt about it, it's the oldest lie that's been told about the Kennedy assassination. And in fact, it was being disseminated, that lie, it was a disinformation line by the CIA and its friendly assets in the American media and the world media while the president's body was still warm. That was the first conspiracy theory being pumped out about the Kennedy assassination. And here's why it was preposterous. I'll, I'll go into some of the just key things. At the very moment when President Kennedy is being shot in Dallas, he's meeting with a peace envoy, Castro, from JFK, the French journalist John Daniel, who's carrying an olive branch from Kennedy. Now, this is one of several uh, peace envoys who... Uh, on the president's request, has gone down to Havana to try and find a way, finally, to defuse the tension uh, between Havana and Washington. And as soon as the message is delivered in Havana, they find out of the assassination, C Castro is devastated because he now realizes these peace, these back-channel peace negotiations are finished. And he says to uh, you know Jean Daniel, "This is terrible. Basically, everything's changed." And then he says, now watch, the next thing we'll know, we'll hear, is that they're pinning it on me. And of course, that's exactly the next broadcast from America, is connecting Lee Harvey Oswald to Cuba through the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. You know, uh, the Bridge of Spies film by Spielberg uh, leaves one key thing out, the new f film. It's a, you know entertaining movie with Tom Hanks and so on, and it's about this guy who is... Uh, an American hero, James Donovan, who was a New York corporate attorney who was recruited by Kennedy to go to Berlin to, uh, you know, to win the release of Francis Gary Powers in return for uh, the release of a Soviet spy. And it's a great story, but he, it's presented as if he's doing this pretty much on his own, like he's a lone ranger. And as I wrote in my op-ed piece recently in the Washington Post, this actually, you know, very delicate diplomatic dance had the complete support of Khrushchev in Moscow and Kennedy in Washington because both of these world leaders were actually trying to defuse the Cold War and this was one of the first steps in that direction. Now, they also leave out the fact, uh, there's a little crawl at the end of the movie saying, oh, later Jim Donovan was used by Kennedy to win the release of the Bay of Pigs prisoners in Cuba, which is true. But there's an even more interesting story about Jim Donovan and Kennedy in Cuba, which is that after he won the release of the Bay of Pigs prisoners, the Kennedy brothers asked Donovan again to widen his efforts in Cuba and to establish a broader peace uh, understanding with Castro. And he went down on more than one occasion, hit it off with Castro. They were both were drinkers. They loved to talk, Donovan and Fidel, late into the night. And uh, he uh, was on the verge of, uh, of a, you know, forging a rapprochement with uh, Havana. But uh, the CIA was not in support of this. And when they got word of this back channel that Kennedy had set up with Havana, they actually went to Donovan and said, hey, on your next trip to Cuba, we understand that Fidel is a scuba enthusiast. Why don't you take him this wetsuit? Uh, which he will enjoy putting on. Well, the wetsuit, of course, was infused with poisons cooked up in the CIA labs. This is a famous story, of course, that one of the many ways that the CIA tried to kill Castro was with a poison wetsuit. So here's the CIA in one of the many cases in which it tried to sabotage Kennedy policy, and the Kennedy policy aimed at ending the Cold War with Moscow and Havana, and this is one of the most flagrant ways, using a peace emissary, this peace envoy, who was an American hero, to try and kill Castro unwittingly. So it's a remarkable story, and, uh, you know, the CIA's effort to blame Castro for what I believe actually came out of the anti-Castro plot against Kennedy, as Bobby Kennedy figured out immediately as Attorney General, and I write about it, this in both my books, Brothers and Devil's Chessboard, that's the source of the plot not Castro himself, it's the anti-Castro operation that's being run by the CIA with the Mafia's help. That's the blowback that killed JFK. And, you know, Fidel Castro had nothing to do with JFK's assassination. It's, it's sort of like a forest for the trees discussion. I mean, I'm really awestruck by the minutia and the detail that you provide, which really makes it you know, show, don't tell. But to me, this, don't you think that the collaboration begins before World War II and that the national security state was actually born out of World War I and the whole creation of Nazi Germany is a feature 
of U.S. foreign policy, and that this entire endless war machine is much older than World War II. I mean, if you could... Yeah, no, you're right. And for simplicity, I, I kind of focus on, in the book, with the World War II period and with Dallas slipping across the border into Switzerland. But I do allude to some of the earlier history as well. And you're right. For instance, Sullivan and Cromwell, their Wall Street law firm, the Dallas Brothers firm, was uh, really made a fortune off of being sort of at the center of the reparations game that was going on at the time, um, you know, to rebuild Germany. And that's where they start to embed themselves uh, in these German corporate interests. And uh, when Hitler comes on the scene, they just sort of seamlessly go with him as the person who's rebuilding Germany as the regime. Uh, but yeah, it goes back to World War I. I mean, really, you could say, speaking of Smedley Butler, it goes back to the turn of the century when the American Empire first uh, is created in the Spanish uh, American War and the Philippines and uh, Cuba and so on, and those uh, Banana Republic wars that uh, America was fighting. You know, Smedley Butler, who is this Marine hero who's forced as a young Marine to fight in all these dirty wars, these imperial wars throughout the Caribbean and Central America and so on, you know, said later, I wasn't uh, fighting for Uncle Sam, I was fighting for Wall Street. And, you know, um, you know he said he was a, a bigger gangster, basically, than uh, Al Capone. Um, so, and he said war is a racket. You know, he wrote a book, War is a Racket. So, you know, he was drawing on his experience from wars that really were starting at the turn of the century, around 1900, and that Mark Twain, among others, as another great American hero, was crusading against and wrote against, saying America was going down a very dark path. And uh, I wrote a book, actually, it's kind of a, a graphic history, illustrated by the great Spain Rodriguez, the, the late cartoonist in Spain, I worked on that. Uh, that tried to bring, uh, you know, the Butler, Smedley Butler story to a younger audience. So yes, there is more history there. What's the name of that book? Uh, Devil Dog. Do you have that, I Patrick? I, have. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were a Talbot completist. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I have Shadow Knights. Sorry. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Can you talk about Angleton as a, um, a cultural czar, I think you called him? And if I can sneak in a second question, if Dulles' whole kind of world and milieu is deception and lies, how do, you, um, how do you work through that and come to something that seems to be a semblance of the truth in doing research? Yeah, well, good question. So James Jesus Angleton, how many people know that name? Legendary chief of counterintelligence uh, and the leading intellectual Sort of an artist, really, an artist of, artist of deceit um, and covert action. So he was Alan Dulles' right-hand person. They go way back together. Uh, they start working together really during World War II, the final days of the war, where they're very active in Rome. James Angleton has some deep roots in Italy, his family. Um, he prided himself on being very connected there. And that sort of spy versus spy atmosphere in Rome right after the war is fascinating. And I try and evoke that period. You know, one of the things I tried to do, by the way, was write a, an anti-spy novel, basically. I wanted to grip the reader. And I think the book really does pull you along with all these uh, amazing stories. But they're all true. Um, and uh, so Angleton is this amazing character. And one of the things he's doing in Rome is setting up these rat lines to allow the uh, Nazis to escape and he sets up a, a kind of a luxury apartment in Rome for some of the more notorious and flamboyant Nazis um, and uh, so he you know he has a lot of deep history with Dulles and in fact he later said he suggested at the end of his life that the reason I became so successful within the CIA was basically I had the goods on Alan Dulles and he had to keep promoting me um, and so that's an interesting thing. He also was a Catholic, uh, so he had something of a conscience, kind of a soiled conscience, and as he was dying from all the cigarettes he had smoked over the years, and he was racked by coughs and lung cancer at the end, you know, he said um, the heads of the CIA, the great legends of the CIA, like Alan Dulles and Richard Helms, were all going to end up in hell. Uh, he told a, a journalist who was visiting him, and he said, I, I imagine I'll be seeing them there shortly. Um, 
he was this uh, artist in a way, though. As you uh, suggest, at Yale, he uh, published a very uh, well-respected poetry journal. He knew uh, Ezra Pound and hung out with E.E. E. Cummings. Um, and he, you know, he understood that the Cold War was ver very much a war of ideas and a culture war. And so under Angleton and his um, deputies within the CIA, they pumped a fortune into different front groups, um, the cultural front organizations that subsidized poets and uh, poetry journals and uh, conferences, literary conferences and magazines, uh, including some of the more famous ones, Paris Review and so on, uh, Encounter magazine. So he understood this war as an, a war of ideas, an intellectual war, and um, that, and, and, he, and he was able to create, I think, a very strong cultural hegemony within sort of the intelligentsia in this country and in Western Europe. Um, and you broke away from that at great peril to your career, really. I mean, suddenly funds would dry up, you didn't get teaching positions, you know. It was very effective. So Stalin, you know, in the Soviet Union maybe had more brutal methods of controlling intellectuals and artists, but certainly uh, the Western way, the Angleton way, was almost even more effective in some ways uh, because it was full of self, it was driven by self-censorship and uh, a sense that we didn't want to break away as an artist from this Cold War consensus. So the, pe the few people who did at the time were heroes, I think, and one of the ones that I highlight in my book is C. Wright Mills, who, when I was in college, was you know, a very well-known figure because of his book, The Power Elite, but it's been largely forgotten now. Um, but you know, he was a critic of these Cold War intellectuals. He said, basically, you're all about American triumphalism, and, uh, and celebrating uh, America, and you sh that's not the role of an intellectual. The role of an intellectual is to be rigorously independent and critique power, and you've all sold out. And intellectuals like Arthur Schlesinger, liberals, who were among the most compromised by Angleton and his cultural funding, were furious at people like at, at Mills. And so there were great debates between Mills and Schlesinger. Sadly, you know, Mills, after championing the Cuban Revolution, he wrote a, a, a big bestseller called Listen Yankee. He went down to uh, Cuba and hung out with Fidel and Che in the early days. He died very young. I think it was late 40s. Uh, in 1962, I think it was. <sighs> One more? One more. I mean, I must come up here. They won't show up on TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think a lot of your audience here today came out uh, either inclined to believe your particular counter narrative or with a counter narrative of their own that they wanted <laughs> to put to you. Um, as someone who simply wandered in because the topic seemed interesting, you use two terms in describing the book. One is a counter-narrative, which I think means something intended to question the common narrative. The other one is a true story, which means something else entirely, <laughs> especially for a historian. Why is the, you know, the let's say Georgetown political science student or the MIT computer science student, somebody who's educated, who has an idea of what logic is, but who may not be an expert in the subject, why, what, why should they take yours to be the true story? Well, that's a good question. Uh, and you really have to read the book, you know, not just <laughs> listening tonight, to uh, look at the evidence that I compile and the argument that I put together. You know, I think speaking of Arthur Schlesinger, I think it was Schlesinger who said history is an ongoing argument. And I understand that my book will be challenged uh, from many directions, and it is being challenged. And, you know, the people who have their own ideological bias that I can see right away that are trying to knock this story down, I dismiss those. But I take uh, to heart, actually, people who have done their own work and uh, have researched uh, this uh, history as uh, exhaustively as I have. And so I often learn from these dialogues with them, you know, whether it's on the internet or face to face. Uh, I understand I didn't get everything right. I didn't get the whole story, perhaps. But I really do think this is the work of my lifetime. And Karen uh, Croft and I worked very hard on this. We've been working basically for about 10 years on this, when you look at both my book, Brothers, and this book. And um, 
I think this book is the most complete version of this history that we have at this point. I expect it to, you know, as I say, to be challenged and to evolve maybe over time. But as of the year 2015, if you want a real understanding of what happened in the Cold War to this nation and the rise of the secret government and how democracy was uh, undermined and how people were killed, heroes who would fight that secret state, then I think you have to read my book. Great. That's a great way to end. I want to let you know, too, that David will uh, be at the Howard Zinn Book Festival, which is November 15th at the uh, Mission uh, uh, branch of City College. Thank you, David. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, concerned citizens. And please, I'll be signing books. Yes, please right? get some books. And Where should I be? Get them tonight? signed. Why don't you Over stay there? there? Okay, stay Just, here. Yeah. Or a table. Maybe yeah, with I'll a move, table. I can oh, move okay. these for you. Okay. This looks cool. The name's been lost, hasn't it, for the most part? Yeah. <laughs> Are you studying history? Or? Um, I, it's a passing interest.